Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Um, for the past two weeks, I spoke about very little about GCOM because I indicated that we had seen some sign of progress in GCOM in terms of preparation for the elections. And um, I made a commitment that we will keep exposing to the public, Guyanese public, any attempt to deviate from that path, a path towards free and fair elections in Guyana. So I had expressed um, some contentment that we were getting important international oversight not only for election day activities, but for the, but within GCOM itself, within GCOM itself, that we, there was a commitment for advisors to come in from the Commonwealth and to be resident within GCOM, and also there were receiving, GCOM was receiving technical help from Canada and from the US, etc. Now I'm a bit disappointed that the advisors from the Commonwealth are not here as yet. Um, they should have been here before now, but sometimes people don't want to come for Christmas. And I do think that if they arrive early in January, that will be, give them adequate time to run the internal tests to ensure that we do not compromise on quality in terms of preparation for elections. They can run the tests on the list and look at polling their logistics, etc. I would have preferred them to be here very early. Now, as we move forward, there are a few challenges that are confronting GCOM at this point in time. The challenge to recruit professional staff or staff who will conduct themselves professionally on polling day and in the run up to the elections. And this has to be an open, transparent, fair process for recruitment of the staff. And not just recruitment, but the selection process itself has to be open and fair. And there, there have been lots of charges in the past. One ended up all the way to the ERC and the ERC adversely rule against GCOM on one of those matters. So we hope we do not have a repetition of that kind of situation, that people will be hired on the basis of merit. Whatever the configuration of the staff at the end of the day, the PPP will not have a problem with who gets hired, provided they are professional people, and they're hired on the basis of merit. That's, that's the first issue. So we will be paying close attention to this matter. The reason I'm saying this is because some people who have been tainted in the past, not, not tainted as Guyanese, et cetera, but just tainted in the sense that they have been overtly political. We see their names appearing now for some key positions within GCOM and in the staff, responsible for some vital areas and also on polling day itself. And therefore, those people who have demonstrated in the past that they, that they act in a partisan manner on polling day should have no place in the elections machinery because they can work with the parties but not be part of the elections machinery. So we'll pay careful attention to that issue about st staff and placement of staff. We have already suggested to GCOM about a random placement of people, so no one knows which polling place you're, you're gonna be managing, that particularly presiding officers. So that could help with the fairness and thwart any attempt to have an orchestrated plan to, to rig elections. The second issue um, 
that I thought we were making progress on was the compromise that we struck with GCOM. We had argued that the house to house data that was gathered from a process that was stopped by GCOM, that was not taken to its completion, and it was stopped because of a ruling of the Chief Justice, who claimed that the intent of the, who, who ruled that the intent of the house to house exercise was illegal, that is replacing people's names on the NRR. So having stopped the exercise, there was some, from the APNU commi commissioners, there is this unbelievable push to use the house to house data uh, from the truncated process and to merge it with the verified data that had been gathered over many years and that had been very, not only verified and scrutinized, but had taken us to four national, four, not four national, two national and two local government elections with no objections. So they attempted to do so. Now we have come down to a position, they did not post the, they did not put the house to house data up for claims and objection, so it was not verified. There was no order to do that. So we said, nevertheless, because the PPP wants to see every single Guyanese who took the effort to get registered to be on the list, um, and those who, no, through no fault of theirs, um, did not get a chance to re-register in the claims and objection, we should, once they're real people and they're eligible as voters, they should get on the list. And that is a compromised position because right now the use of the data is, is illegal given that it was never put to, to claims and objections. But you can't have an elections petition filed against you if you enfranchise people. You can have a, an elections petition if you disenfranchise people. So that was our position. Now you remember the APNU commissioners. You will recall that the APNU commissioners were claiming that the gold standard of testing duplication is the fingerprint exercise. They, that they argue that all the time and until recently. So the fingerprint cross-matching showed up and until re it's now Vincent Alexander just recently changed his position in an interview he gave yesterday. But all along they were saying once the, the fingerprint cross-matching is done, those that are considered new, that are not a match on the NRR should all be merged with, with the, the database, the NRR, and put, put on the voters list. So you recall, I, I explained to you what happened at the cross-matching, that when they sent up the data, that of the 365,000 on through the house, truncated house to house exercise, Reg registration that they had done, cross match against the NRR, 305,000 were considered duplicate names. So they were already on the NRR. So that you would assume that 60,000 would be the new registrants. So that was sent back to us. Of the 60,000, um, 37,300 were over 18 years old, and 22,600 were below 18. So for, we will only deal with the 18 and above because only they can get on the voters list. So 37,000 people, they said, are new. New registrants who would be eligible to vote after the cross-matching. Internal, we found that there are many people in that 37,000 who they considered new after the fingerprinting exercise who are already on the, on the voters list and voted in the past. So they can't be new people. 
So when GCOM did an internal check, they did, they ran it against the date own database using first name, middle name, and date of birth. And then more recently, they did a manual exercise. They found of the 37,000, another 17,000 who were already on the list. So the gold standard was not the, the cross-matching. And we had always argued that the gold standard could not be the cross-matching because it's dependent on the inputting, input errors, a whole range of stuff. Computers don't differentiate that. If you put in the wrong set of fingerprints or, or they smudge, etc., it shows up as a new registrant when the person is already on the database. So they had 20,000 names now considered new, and this for two weeks. So we said, fine, you can refine this further, or let us go out and check the 20,000 people. Now, this could be done in a week, and that's leisurely. We could have done completed this already. Leisurely check all the names. You remember in the, the, reg the registration exercise, they were claiming that they were doing 20,000 a day. Per, uh, per day they were doing, registering people. And we can check the two parties along with GCOM staff can go and check the 20,000 people in a week. It would be easy to do that. So they're just dilly dallying all the time there, sitting on the 20,000, pushing the timeline now because when soon you would have to put out the revised voters list. And now we're at a stage where they're arguing the new position now, and yesterday Vincent Alexander said a decision was made at the commission. From what I gather from the opposition commissioners, no such decision was made, that they want to do a sample of the 20,000. Now, not to check the 20,000 names, but do a sample. So assuming, so, so it, we'll never accept that because it means that if you sample the 20,000, you, you will get probably and a 10% sample they want to do. So you'll have over 18,000 people who can get on the list and not be verified. Not be verified. And to get on the voters list in the past, every single person, including those through claims and objection, had to subject themselves to a visit on their homes. I changed my address and I had to, they came to visit me at home to see if I actually lived there. That's just to change your address, much less if you're a new person. But they want to include 18,000 unverified names onto the database. And so by doing a sample, when you can within a week check all 20,000 and see who are real and who are not real. So this we will never accept because it means contamination of the database. And if they want to do that, then we will go back to our original position that nobody, nobody should, no, none of the house to house data should be used because it means that they're gonna, you're gonna use it in an unverified fashion. So let me give you a couple of examples. Assuming in this representative sample, we found in Bartica in one house nine persons registered. This is two buildings away from the GCOM, um, GCOM's office. Nine persons registered. Seven of them never lived there. Never ever lived there. We share this information. So assuming that in this random sample, you don't, these are new registrants, and you don't pick them up, right in the random sample. Then you could have a perfect random sample, but seven unverified persons who never lived at that address get onto the, onto the database as voters. And this is where I, this indecent position pushed by Vincent Alexander and the others to use this unverified data makes me very suspicious because you could very well have people here who might be in the 18 year category when they should have been in 14 or multiple registration. And that is something we are paying close attention to 
but I hope that the chair of GCOM understands that we, we, although we argued that the House Dow's data was not put to the claims and objection, that the, through the statutory process, we are prepared to accept all the new registrants once they are verified from the House Dow's exercise, but not a sampling of the new registrant. And what if the sample finds 10% 10, 10 of the 10% not there? So what are you going to do? Use it or not use it? Because if you use it, then you could very well add 10% of the people who are not verified, no real voters being added to the list. It doesn't make sense using the sampling when you can easily go to every home and complete the exercise in a short period. To, and then you would say every single person on the database, the voters list, is verified so that you don't have an issue about it. So I want the public to know that we are very vigilant about this. I promise that I'll keep you informed about these matters. Um, they, we, we saw some progress, but the last week now with this new proposal about this sampling is, is a setback that we'd have, we'd have to address. The government has recently been on on a PR offensive. So I notice um, in many areas, people who were dodos, who did nothing over the years, have suddenly come alive. Like they had some life injected to them. And so not, suddenly they're speaking about everything. The government is busy at work. But often, it's just to get in the new cycle. But when you look at the reality of what they're getting into the new cycle for, you would see how it's a reinforcement of Ga the perception under the, of Guyanese that this government is not just incompetent, but is clueless about any of the sectors in which it's managing. So we had a big PR show about the minister the central bank signing a pact for oil revenue fund. Now this Gobin Ganga, if he gets a call from the minister, he runs over to the ministry. This is the central bank reports to the minister. How much independence do you have here? In a, when Gobin Ganga, a big show is made about this pact that you know, that they sign now between the central bank and the minister to manage the fund. It's all a show. Where is the principle that we've been talking about that we want to, that we made clear in our manifesto that we want to enshrine in our version of the sovereign wealth fund, the principle of arms length management of the sovereign wealth fund and more a technical rather than a political management of the fund. That, that's just one point. He then goes on, so, so that's the first thing. The, this, the National Resources Fund is, is a fund that is created from a legislation that is illegal as far as we're concerned. So I don't know what's the big hullabaloo about this whole issue. It was passed after the no confidence motion uh, was validly passed in the National Assembly. This bill was then taken to, was then passed by the National Assembly. So the government had fallen when this bill was passed when this will was passed. But you recall the long journey to get to that point, even the tabling of the bill, they kept promising and missing all the deadlines. And the model and the consultations that were promised never materialized. That is the model about transparent and arm's length management of resources. So this, this, it's, it's no use, we, we made it clear. 
we are going to repeal this act and then re-enact a, a proper sovereign wealth fund that has appropriate safeguards and that will keep the management of the sovereign wealth fund at arm's length from political authority. So the minister then goes on. He speaks a lot about, there are several issues he spoke about. Where the money would be held, it would be held in abroad. The key issue is the safeguard. The 18 million US dollars, the, the, those funds were held abroad too. But what happened? The same Jordan said, um, we never requested nor did we receive it. When he knew they already had it in an account that his ministry set up that would not fall under the jurisdiction of the Auditor General, that would not be paid into the Consolidated Fund, which is, which is a necessity, which is mandatory by our law, the FMAA and the Constitution of Guyana. He didn't defy the Constitution and the FMAA and kept it outside of the Consolidated Fund. And the, it was not part of the central bank balance, balance sheet. So it would have not been um, subjected to audit there. So not an audit by the Auditor General nor the central bank. And it was never reflected as a, a revenue to the state, which it was in all the estimates that were produced for three years. So you could, holding the, tree, the money, we don't know how much we'll get as yet per annum, abroad or not, is, means nothing if you were, they were holding the 18 million abroad. But it is how it's governed. And the, the minister lying about it through his teeth, bare face liar. In another country, be in jail already, I said that. In another country. And we, and we made it clear we're passing legislation to ensure that that will happen. Anyone who does that in the future. So you recall the big campaign issue about APNU? They, wanna, they said we had these slush funds at, F, at F, NISIL, at um, Forestry Commission, at GGMC, at NFMU, the housing fund, and that they will transfer all of them into the consolidated fund because it was illegal to keep them outside of the consolidated fund. Now the FMAA says there are three places you can keep public money. One is the consolidated fund, two in a deposit account, but you have to notify parliament immediately, and which didn't happen in the case of the oil, or three, you can keep it in accounts where there's special legislation governing those funds. So NFMU has its own law, the Lotto has its own law, the GGMC has its own uh, the legislation. Uh, the, that is why those resources could have been kept outside. But every one of them was, every one of those funds was audited and they did not find a single cent missing from any of them. In fact, they found large sums of money that they have disappeared now. The 10 million in GGMC, uh, uh, 5 billion, 10, 10 billion do dollars, five in, in Forestry Commission, eight billion in the Housing Ministry. Not a cent missing, they were sitting in special accounts because they were governed by special law. In this case, none of that happened. There was no special account at that time, no special legislation it had to be paid. And so today, the, this is the same Jupiter's guy, Jordan, who used to argue and rant and rave about these slush funds, and they were not slush funds. They were held outside legally in accordance with our law. Now he does this sort of thing. So when I see a Jordan talking about, oh, we're holding our money in the Reserve Bank of New York, so it would not all be available, it's just nonsense to me. 
because you need to understand his history and Abnu's history on this matter. So there are lots of other things. He talks about, oh, the, not all the money would be available to spend in the treasury. But in this model of the sovereign wealth fund that they call the natural resources fund, guess what happens? As we pointed out several times, the minister is, the central bank is in charge of the fund and you know the relationship between the central bank and the minister. The minister is overall in charge. The minister appoints the macroeconomic committee. The minister appoints the investment committee. The minister discusses the f sustainable amount to withdraw from the fund. The minister decides the fiscally sustainable sum to withdraw from the account. It's not it, the other. The, the committees that are set up are all advisory to him. He makes the final decision. So he talks about, oh, oh, oh we'll be governed by rules, et cetera, and you can't have all the money to spend. They will take every single cent and spend it up and waste it all out, like what they're doing, running down all the accounts now. We've seen this happen in so many countries. And, and you get more souped up Lexus, Lexus bought for the president and a couple more parks and stuff like that. That's all we'd get. So when, whilst all of this is happening, this PR offensive, and, and the whole, he runs the media off in a different direction. So you see a big write-up as though they know what they're doing. It's all a cover to see, to hide what they've actually done in the, the sector. To hide what they've done in the sector. The sector, they made a mess of the sector. Total mess. They have no clarity because they compromise. They can't negotiate anything or renegotiate anything because they're compromised. They're in the peop people's pockets. That, that is what's happening. So whilst this is out there, the smoke screen is out there, they are busy trying. I got it, they called a company I'm not going to name the company to say, can you put in a proposal to, to move, to lift our share of profit oil, the barrels? And they call the company, they have to do it within two days. But they don't really want that company. They want to say they co consulted widely because behind the scenes, they are working on a deal and a corrupt transaction to tie up a long-term contract for the lifting of our share of the profit oil, the barrels. And we are never going to accept that. That is why we argued that if, as the Department of Energy claim, our share of profit oil will come in March or so, then why not, if, even if it's done before the elections, why not allow Exxon to sell the, for one or two months until after the elections? and put the money in an account. Just two months. And then you have an open, transparent way of ensuring who sells our, our oil through a bidding process. So every company comes with a track record, and they have to bill, bid for who will sell our oil for us and what price we'll get at with guarantees. So whilst all of this big smoke screen is going on, they're busy tying up corrupt, corrupt arrangements behind the scenes behind the scenes. And, this, and if they stick us with another con long-term contract there, we'd be in trouble. We, there may be liabilities if we break the contract. But we are arguing now they have no right to sign any such contract because they're not just caretaker, they become illegal. Illegal, this is an illegal government. So, <clears throat> this. I see this Kaicho News ad, and I hope you'd be kinder to me. Um, I see they said, you know, I know what you're trying to do in Kaichur, to say that it's a terrible deal, and it is. And, we, and, and we're not paying attention to a whole range of things about the pre-contract cost. But Jagdeo didn't find gold in Granger's backyard. So that, we didn't find gold in no Granger's backyard, like here in this thing here. And, and then we didn't throw in a couple of bulldozers and machine and then hand Granger a preparation bill of 10 billion US dollars. People are gullible. They would actually believe that we did that, that we left Granger a bill of 10 billion US dollars, etc. 
they did not negotiate, first of all, the pre-contract costs. They didn't even know. And they have not audited the pre-contract costs until now. So this is very misleading. And you know, it's, I know you don't like criticizing Granger. You always have to throw us in. And so would Granger accept the bill without questioning or scrutinizing it? He's accepted it. He didn't scrutinize it already. And Sandro, Sandro Granger hears about it. Ridiculous bill from Jagdeo. It's not Jagdeo. Yes, yes, yeah, but please, leave out Jagdeo and put the factual. People are very gullible. And they read this. I know what you're pointing out. You're trying to use examples, but can't you use somebody else? Use Jason <laughs> or something else or Kwame or, or somebody else. Or use Trotman there. Trotman left the bill. We didn't leave all of this bill, this 10 billion bill. Uh, right, okay, so I, I read this, and please, because people actually believe this sort of thing in this country. We didn't leave no, no big bill for Granger. In fact, he ran up all the bills. So, so I just wanted um, to talk a bit about that, because I see a big hype, uh, oh, PR offensive and stuff about this. And really, they're just screwing us a bit more as a country. And so, so another big PR offensive is done by the Lands and Survey Department. So, um, so a project from that was announced since 2018, um, a project has been delayed now, and this project will map the whole of Guyana. We're going to come back about this project to talk about the corruption and why, why it's really stalling. It's not stalling because of some theft of one laptop, an 18 million US project. There are lots of issues, and we'll come back and talk about that. So that was one of the things. Gen GLSC approved 849 leases for this year. Ask how many for the cronies. Cronies would now release this until now. We don't know whether Christopher Jones, I believe he got the land in Festival City, that people were living there for 50 years. They were living on that piece of land there for 50 years. He claims he has the lease, and, and the lands and survey is saying he doesn't have the lease. He doesn't have, that's what they're saying, but I don't think Christopher Jones is is going to lie that openly. Oh, well, you never know. But the thing is that the, the, they're trying to throw the people out of a plot of land in Festival City that have been on for 50 years. With, uh, through, through Christopher Jones and, and the people in Lands and Survey. So GLSC sacks three employees over corrupt practices. If anybody needs to be sacked over corrupt practices, is, is this man here, Ben, Trevor Ben. He should be the first one to be sacked for corrupt practices, not the junior people. Now people who, who you know, they inflate some, they, they paid back a bill of $30,000 for they bought some drinks or something like that. This, this here, you will see a tale once the government changes of extravagance and corrupt spending by, by his office, by his office. And all of these, these things. Then I saw records missing somewhere that are for headache for auditors. And I know why the records are missing, because a lot of these things that are given out illegally, um, they can't, they can't, um, they don't want, I'm, I'm sure they're destroying a lot of the records in there. I'm sure about that. So this is just a PR offensive. Five new stories this week for Lands and Survey, the most corrupt agency in, in Guyana now, under the stewardship of Mr. Ben. He claims that he's been hacked. This is an excuse. You know, I've been hacked. The, the Lands and Survey, we've been hacked. This is an excuse to disappear some of the documents that you've been hacked, so oh, we lost our files, etc. 
So when we, we, we do audits of the place, you wouldn't find this. This here, this guy has created in within Lands and Survey, uh, a group of people who are incompetent. He recruited them to replace the professionals in Lands and Surveys. He deals capriciously with application. I don't like these people here, so these have to stay on my desk. The staff come here and tell me, and I would not sign their leases. And another set, he calls down to say, send, the, send those files out. This is what's happening in Lands and Survey. So he goes on a PR offensive because they've been on, on the fire for, for some of the, the legalities they're doing. And suddenly they're opening up more lands. They're interested in mapping Guyana. This is an old project, by the way. And a lot of it is not about just mapping land. It's an old project that to upgrade the entire, entire system. So I've seen uh, a, a PR offensive uh, offensive in, in that regard too. I, I noticed that Mr. Granger has said that he wants to, in today's, today's newspapers, I think, in a comment that he's trying to professionalize the um, foreign ministry and that Director General Waddell's uh, um, move, moving Director, um, Director General Waddell from that position as Director General was a promotion, not a demotion. And, and every time, I keep saying, he is the best campaign, campaigner for the PPP, President Granger. He's the best campaigner for the PVP because every time he opens his mouth, it's, it's a plethora of contradictions. And, and really, I don't understand what goes through his head. It's like, it's like strange. So he says he wants to professionalize the, the service. So they're removing politically appointed people. You know, and, and the assumption is that these were people that the PPP hired. But Kami Ramsarup was put there by APNU. Clarissa Real was put there by APNU. Hamley Case, they were all political appointees by APNU. He did it, and he wants to professionalize. Now we're coming, they're caught with their pants down because of what happened. This entire shakeup has nothing to do with professionalizing the ministry. It has to do with a, a, a bunch of people who are incompetent for, as far as I'm concerned, and who would sell out national interest for perks. They have the heirs of the authority there in the, uh, the leadership of the foreign ministry and his heirs. And this is a reaction and an explanation after the disastrous um, act of, of demoting the, the director general, which came out of, it seems as though from all I've been hearing, out of a ton of internal disagreements on policy, particularly policy relating to our sovereignty where they should, that should be uncompromising. And there are a few people who stood up against that and they're suffering the consequences now. This has nothing to do with professionalizing the, the foreign ministry. Absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. Because you still have a lot of people who are of the same age group who've been political, uh, political appointees out there. There are several others who were, who were appointed by this, by this government who didn't come out of the foreign ministry. And, and so this, to give an explanation like that shows you're aloof. And I, I think Clarissa Real pointed this out. 
in, she was the first person who used the word actually when there was a contest with Granger and someone else. I don't know if it was 2011 or 2014 at the PNC for the leadership of the PNC. She emerged, she was upset about what took place, how the elections took place, and she described him as aloof. And she was prophetic. And she was right, because that is come to characterize him now aloof. This is not interested in anything, uninterested, and has no vision. And this is, this is what we're getting. They believe, they believe that we would believe this nonsense. They believe we believe. And furthermore, AFC gives itself an A plus in their paper for performance. And the Norton said, yeah, we, we're very satisfied with how we have performed. Most corrupt, incompetent government in our entire history, they're satisfied with it. Because they live in a very different world. And the, I'm talking about the corruption, so now it has started everything. So they're spending a ton of money on toys. A ton of money on buying toys now. The people are calling us to say, what do we do from whom they're buying the toys? Because they're saying, um, we're, we're going to buy $10 million of toys from you. You only give us $3 million, but the $7 million, you can give us back the cash. And we, we take $3 million in toys, the toys, the actual toys. It's a hustle. Everything is a hustle. The campaign material that they're printing, printing through state funds. Flags, t-shirts, etc. And they're working out arrangements. Transportation and other expenses for this launch that they have on the third, all the transportation and other bills and stuff like that, drinks and stuff like that, being, would be funded from the ministry, the, the residency. They're spending already the the contracts, they have 300 million set aside for Marshall Manny next year. So the contracts are being inflated already uh, with the kickbacks. And imagine they spent over from our information, they spent over 60 million. And you should ask Harman or Amnali, you remember when they spent 50 million on the Bojubantan show and she said, it's PNC money, it's their money, it's not taxpayers' money. Well, it turned out to be taxpayers' money. She was lying. Well, they've already spent, I gather, over 60 million, not on mushroom money, on Carnival, which will be in May next year. May next year. So what they've done is they're buying the tickets. They bought the tickets. And they're selling back some of the tickets now. They're selling the tickets. So... They, they give out to some of their activists and the others are sold. So if they sell back 40 million of the tickets, that's 40 million that goes back to them and 20 million would be given out to some of their supporters. You can ask, ask Harman whether this is not true or, or Amnali, ask them and then you would, you would find out. So this is, this is what's happening Every single thing has become a hustle. And the thing is that they're very righteous about it. They, you remember Annette Ferguson. She, she, was, she, they had, she had a press conference with, for selective media houses. I don't know if Kaichoro was invited or that book or the others, but at which she um, describe herself as herself as righteous and Jagdi was wicked. As I said earlier, she did some calculation on square footage what I bought my land for and hers. And maths is not her strong point. Maths is not her strong point. And you know, and that's putting it mildly. That's putting it mildly. So. Uh, but and, and I, I wonder, when she used to work at GPO, she had trouble there too, uh, some issues on misappropriation. But more, most 
I, I wonder what happened in that, if she had anything to do with the accounts at GPO. Maybe that's why Edge Hill was chairman of the board one time before he became minister. He had so much trouble there. But the, the reality is that she said she didn't get the, this. Um, it was all an excuse. I don't even need to talk about the house. I don't need to even talk about it. You look for yourself, you'd see the evidence of it. Moving from there, just before the elections, junior position in the GPO, to what, what it has now. So, and this is after two years in office, she started building. Well, you know, I've been at least, what, 18 years in public office as president and finance minister and everything before I started building my house, which is a big campaign issue. And then, and they can check all my accounts. But let's, let's so the, but the, the thing that bothers me most is how self-righteous they are. She, she quotes the scripture, a vile abuse of the scripture. Vile abuse of scriptures. I remember Trotman too. He quotes the scriptures all the time in parliament and, and makes the most, the nat, nastiest uh, speeches and inserts passages of the Holy Bible into his vile speeches. This is what they do as though it would absolve them from what we know, the corruption. They have to answer for this if they're, uh, no, they should not take God's name in vain. But the, this bunch here, you remember the, the, the Eric Phillips too. Eric Phillips said the same thing. She was going along the same route. Oh, Jack, there was lying on me until the tape came out. I, didn't, I don't need to answer. So Eric Phillips said the same thing. He wrote on February 22nd, Jack, there was lying. I didn't receive any land. From, I didn't receive no 3,000 acres from, from the lands and survey. When I showed the evidence, he went quiet. He, have, he, he got 2,000 acres of land. And then he accused the media of being in a conspiracy with me to mislead, mislead the public. That's not a blatant lie. So you, this is what has got, become characteristic of this government. They're going to lie. If you talk to Cathy Yu, she is also self-righteous, you know, but busy doling out contracts to herself in her ministry. Every, uh, you have a ton ton of these, and that's not, not, not the end. Ram, Ram Jatan, he's the, probably one of the worst ones, worst ones. And he still has to tell us a bit about the Capital One account in Valley Stream in New York. Mm. He should, you should ask him a bit about that. So this is what we've known. Uh, this is going to continue for a long time in the future. And just, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You, you saw how ballistic they went um, up noon when they, some old story was resurrected from a Mr. Ellis about, he said that the PPP is likely to win their 2020 elections. And they went ballistics. The whole chronicle was all about uh, cussing out Ellis, etc. cetera. Uh, but what Ellis is saying, we don't need Ellis to tell you this. You go to street corners in Georgetown or around the country. Why do we need Ellis to tell us this? The whole country knows this. And because of the incompetence, we, we can't last five years or with this bunch. They don't have a vision, they don't have any plan, they're just corrupt, incompetent. What else? Not everything you can think about. We're going nowhere. In fact, they're running down our reserves. So why, why go after Ellis? Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of things because I saw it gain something. Mr. Schumann keeps saying that the PPP, I saw Kaitro News headline, that the PPP wanted to meet him with him through a back door for coalition agreement. So I know I, that's, that's not true. Um, he'd been claiming that he wrote us and we didn't respond. Um, and we have never received a letter from, I never received a general secretary of the party, a letter from him about a meeting that he requested. He said he wrote Erfan Ali, and I asked Erfan Ali, and Erfan Ali said he never received a letter. If 
if we wanted a coalition with him, why would we not meet with him and then send body, somebody through the back door? I, I am the general secretary of the party, and I never authorized anybody to, to talk with him. And we made it clear that we are willing to work with everyone, provided that they subscribe to the views, uh, many of which are outlined in our manifesto. There is no deal. You have to win seats before you divide the seats, not like the PNC and AFC and there are other parties in the coalition. They're dividing ministries and seats before they win them. We believe that you have to win them from the getting votes before you do that. And that is not attractive to some of these parties. They want a guarantee, please, you know, or, oh, I get one ministry or a position. A lot of them are emboldened by the success of Keith Scott, a one-man party, who has now succeeded to become a minister. So, so we know we know into that, and we're making it clear. But we work with everybody. Once we share, subscribe the same view, and we made it clear, we will stay away from criticizing these parties, small parties. But if they misrepresent our record, we will come after them. I notice Badel has been doing that, and at some point in time, I'll talk about him. But I want to make it public again. If you misrepresent our record, we will deal with, with this issue. The issue. Um, I, I'm very concerned about one last thing, is the, the land that they're promising people, um, they're giving it out again. So I see a lotto, lottery now. Suddenly, they have a lottery for Madia. They're giving out pieces of lands and papers, everyone. It's only because of election time that you're getting a slip of paper saying you're, you're eligible for a piece of land, etc. It's A lot of these lands are already gone or they're going to cronies. So I just wanted people to, because people came here and asked me, oh, oh, I got this little notice here saying that I get a piece of land, but I don't really don't know where the plot is and stuff. But they're busy sharing this out now, you know, to say, vote for us, and therefore this is your insurance at getting a plot of land if you have a little paper signed by Valerie Patterson, who I gather lives in a, ski, in a house built by Irfan Ali too, and when he was minister of um, housing. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, I'm Jacob. You spoke of a concern over over the political um, persons their name service in front of one. Are you prepared to name any of these persons and why you call them over the political? On the 18 million, you said that this was not in the past three years, they were not being reflected as influence. as general secretary and uh, opposition leader, can you say what is the state of that uh, 18 million received from Exxon? Has it been spent for the legal or training? Okay, so I gather that after, so it's not reflected in the estimates. You know, every year the minister presents the estimates. So by it's a mandatory that you see all the revenue and the expenditure for that year. So 2017, 2018, 2019, remember they received this money since 2016. It's, it's none of those accounts. So if you pick up the, the national accounts of the country now, you will not see the 18 million reflected. It's only because we filed a case, the PP filed a case in the court that this year, right, that case was there, that they've transferred it now. They, know they, they knew they were gonna lose the case. They transferred the money. We don't know how much we heard they transferred. So we don't know how much was actually transferred into the consolidated fund. So we, we, that, is, that is it. And yes, we're prepared to name the names. We have pictures of people who were on platform in, in APNU t-shirts, etc., who are applying for senior positions. So you can't be that overtly political. I would expect too that if they see a PPP activist, that they would object to that. I would expect that from them too, who was applied. 
So that we want to keep people who are there, not that they may or that they particularly in the senior positions, particularly in the senior position, to, who are more not overtly political. They have their preferences, they will vote however they want to, but they remember the GCOM, that's supposed to be an impartial body. And that is why um, we don't want people who are overtly political. We're not saying you have to not vote or choose your party of your choice. You vote when you go to the polling place. But that's, that's a different matter. When you act as a GCOM official, you have to act impartially. No, nothing. Um, I don't, I'm interested in finding out, but I think our, the government should really give us information. I shouldn't have to run down a company. I'm the leader of the opposition. I don't know if I'm caretaker leader too of the opposition, although I'd never collected salary throughout the period, so I, they, at least they can say I'm collecting the salary. <laughs> you know, as leader of the opposition, I've never collected the salary. But, but they should share this information with us. And particularly, that is the approach that you recall the last time we spoke about, a national type of approach where, say, the bodies with oversight must have members from civil society, the political party, in a real sense. And then not just at the technical level, but, say, engaging with the president. So the leader, the opposition, the president should meet regularly to talk oil and gas and about mapping a way forward. That's how we see it, not just at the, in the technical bodies, you know, like an oversight body, etc. And then to come maybe at right at the beginning to have a one or two days sit down and define how we'll work together in the sector to ensure that the, you maximize benefits to Ghana. Because if both, both sides speak, on the, with the same voice, it's harder for people to come and play you off against each other. And so that's the approach we want to take, and that's the approach we will take. What do you mean with that right now, seeing as you've been saying that you're going to I think now we're at a stage where we're about 80 days away from elections. 80 days away from elections. I think all of those activities should have ceased. Should have ceased. They should. Like the activities that they're busy doing, signing up contracts, like for lifting of our oil. They should just say the holding arrangement is that anything would be piggyback on Exxon. We will check the quantity of oil, leave it at the technical level. With our current state of preparedness, you think that everything should stop right now at the hall? Yeah, I think policy. Poli of course, policy wise, you gotta stop. You can't create policies now, but you can do things that are routine, but you can't enact a new policy. You don't have a mandate. That's, you should look at the definition of caretaker. What the definition? When the, when the CCJ rule, they mention the Canadian model of caretaker. You should look at how they behave in as caretaker. And this government is even worse. They just operating like on a daily basis. Why do you need like, like lot, lottery for mining now, get, selling lands and stuff? All of those things are inconsistent with caretaker status, but they keep doing them. So this is, and we are really 80 days away from elections, not a long, long period, more for the elections. So, so, so everything should be on an, that footing now, political type footing. and. This is when you have technical bodies, like in another country, when the government goes into caretaker or after an election is called or a no confidence vote, the, the management is done at the technical level purely, holding patterns, a holding pattern until the, the political directorate changes. This is what's going on. But they're operating as though they can sign up agreement now that will be with us for 10 years into the future. We're not, we're not going to accept any of those. And that's why I don't want to be seen as complicit with signing up any of these arrangements that we will have to review. Um, the issue we've talked about 
about excellent going forward to serve the contract before your approval of the Kyara project. Um, aren't you concerned that government status right now may be giving the oil companies uh, benefit to strong arms? If they go ahead with any contract or anything that requires a permission of the government and they didn't get the permission of the government, then they are on their own. They're on their own. They're, they, they, those things, we're not obligated to recognize that. And I'm making it clear. So even we have some big issues about cost of services that they're procure, procuring. A lot of these issues are the cost for the FPSOs, the cost for contracts, employment costs, costs for the headquarters, all of these things. If we, these have to, if they are funded from cost oil, we must have a say in them. If they're funded from cost oil. I don't know how, if this contract, the headquarter is funded from cost, cost oil. But if it is, and you're spending 70 million on building a headquarter, that's more than, we might as well build a Marriott. Marriott costs 55. That is, we might as well build a Marriott and give them maybe two, three store, store floors. But you're not interested in talking to them right now, but the contract is No, 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 I'm not, I don't want to get involved in, the, the, the last thing I want to do is people say, oh, we're tying up arrangements with Exxon or anyone now at this point in time the, as a quid pro quo for the future. I was very pleased they said that they're not getting involved politically. They issued a statement. They're not funding any party, which we've been calling for. We're very happy with that. We don't want to be accused of tying up any arrangement with anyone by meeting with them. Next thing you'd hear, like, like what Mr. Hess said, when he said that the opposition gave its no objection or something like that. But you have an understanding. Right, yes, an understanding. I never met Hess in my life. That's why I would stay far away from him. Uh, Mr. Jack, in the absence of a written uh, protection, how do you say that we won't be obligated for those contracts that are given up without our permission when they can simply recover from the different fields? Uh, ring fencing is different than the cost or what becomes eligible to be deducted from cost oil. Two different things. But they're not limited to the field. <clears throat> yes. So ring fencing, they can use money for other exploration activities. And also say explore. There, that is why you, you, you use the revenue to finance future exploration. So that is why if you had strong ring fencing provision, they then more profit oil would remain for the country. So you get a bigger payback, the country, in a shorter period. But even if they use the money for, for exploration activities because of lack of ring fencing, it doesn't mean they can pay, call a drilling company and say, I'll give you $200 million. We have to be satisfied that that was competitively sourced competitively sourced. That is the, the issue, that it's competitively sourced. So ring fencing is about a different issue. It's about them financing future expenditure. But my point now is that are we sure that, say for example, pre-contract costs, they gave a bill, and not Jack, they were a bill of 10 billion, but you know, they're, they're, they gave a bill and are we satisfied that that money was actually spent? That was actually spent, that we have to pay back for? So we, we have to go and dig up everything. They have to show us detailly how they came up with the figure and whether it was done competitively too. Because if you go and you're paying, people are eligible in the industry standard to get $10,000 a month, that's the industry standard, but you're paying them $25,000 a month, then why should we be doing this? That's a decision made by, by management. That, those, are, those are 
important issues. That's why I believe if you, you rigidly monitor expenditure to keep the expenditure low and only on necessary issues, and that any services, goods and services, are competitively sourced, then thou can maximize your share of the revenue because you get more profit oil. And that's a critical aspect of better contract administration. So they now, I hear they're recruiting some company who work from the UK to do this or something like that. I don't even know what's happening. God, it costs. Is, is, is the party requesting this information? Do you have this information? No, Would you support I, the call for this information to be released? No, no, but listen, my point is that we can do this. This is a function of a government. This is a function of a bureaucracy. This is, we can go and audit the cost. The, and in any case, Truckman will not give us. Yeah, yes, yes. Well, I think there there are certain things you can you can make public. For example, mm -hmm. if if the price for the FPSO, that should be made public, and then people can look. I've seen already that the price was made public, and people started saying where you can do it and stuff like that. There are some things that that would be public, but the. Uh, but I don't expect, you know, like every person's salary to be made public because, he, right, yes. Yeah, so, so just like in Parliament, the Speaker wouldn't allow us to name a name, although those are public funds. When we ask for the contract for um, Egg Ball and his whole family and cabal in, uh, in GIS, um, not GIS, what do you call it? DPI. DPI, yes. They don't even want us to call the names. We must only know the contracts. We can't mention their names in the parliament. So that, you know, you understand what I'm saying. And that's public funds. And, and, and so, so you got to open up, open up the sector. And you have to have competent people too. If we have a competent core of our people with foreign help, but our people there, in a properly staffed petroleum commission that is purely technical, you got the best people there, with oversight from government and civil society. That's how they will work. That's what we want. And, and that helps the oil companies too, because they have predictability. They know they're gonna get a tough scrutinizing there, but at least they, they wouldn't drift. They wouldn't drift and just have to sit on their investments and all that forever. So that's that's good for everyone. As the leader of the opposition and the leader of a party that could win the next election of one government, you have uh, a certain leverage and influence to hit the issues as you're, as you're happening right now, which is why I'm asking you. Yeah, sure. Are you not concerned to talk to them right now and sort out these matters? Ask them, is this in line with the best practice? Are you attempting to strong arm? I know, I know people have a nostalgia for government because we don't have a government now. We're drifting. So, but we're still opposition. I want you to understand that we can, we're, we're prepared from day one to address these issues. We're, we're prepared, we have the skills, we have competent people, we'll hire competent people. We have a ton of Guyanese who are competent and younger Guyanese too who can, who can really take charge of the sector. And it's not from the PPP alone, from us, from Guyana, from our diaspora, from the local, whether they vote APNU or PPP, they have a place in that architecture. That is how we'll approach it. Right now, we can't be running government. We, we can't be running government they're, because they're not doing anything. If I request, look at, look at the lies too. So, People, Patterson says, go on the Kaicho News the radio station. And he said, I don't have a copy of the contract. He doesn't have a copy of the contract. So guess what? If you look, I have a copy of the contract. You could, you could, you get a copy of the contract here. Look, the contract is here. He has a copy of the contract. This is the airport contract and he has it. It's electronically all around the place. 
So the airport contract, the last time I showed you, there are four options on the building, what's part of the contract, and the type of building we're supposed to get. So I said today I saw Kai Chor talk about the change order, right? The change order. So if they didn't have a contract, I'm trying to find the change order here. It's in the papers. Can somebody get a copy for me? Let me just show you what it says on the trick change order. I should have it. Yes, this is the. I'll get it. Which page is it on? Oh, yes, here. So the change order was done on September 10th, 2015. So this is not the only change order. This was the first change order, and it was done three or four months after they took office. So how can you change, have a change order if you don't have the original contract? Because you're changing from the original to a, the contract. So he's lying. Until now, he keeps lying. So you are asking me to get info from them, but this guy, be a sticky finger, beer face liar. He goes on the air and says, they don't have the contract. And that he released some info to us. So, so all right, so the change, change order was done three months after they, they took office. This is not the only change order. It's, this one is for six, 6.47 million US dollars. They, from what I gather, there are several change orders after this one. So they, they may, it may run to close to 30 million US dollars. And they've adjusted the change order. is not only on price. They've adjusted the square footage and the type of building that we're getting. So we're getting less value for money. But it says the negotiated settlement for this claim is an extra. Imagine in the change order that they signed, this afternoon said, it's an extra 6.7 million. Extra, the word extra is in this change order. And this is the first one. So there are several others. We only managed to get that one of the change order. But if you are asking me to get information from them, and here is a minister lying. You think they're going to supply us with any truthful information? You think they're going to tell us? I've been asking for Nissil to tell the country, not us, how many people they sold or give lands to. You're asking me to get information. No, until now, we can't get it. You try to get something out of Trevor Ben there. Or how many persons connected to ministers have now gotten gold mining, big gold mining blocks? We can't get the information, but we'll get them soon. And you'll get to know about all of these things very soon. Neither one day is there. Thank you. <laughs>